the first question we have is for Sean. Um, it says, outcomes aren't usually seen immediately. So how do you keep monitoring once the program period has ended? That's a that's a great question. It's it's it is extremely difficult. You have to. What we've done is is build in uh, yearly maintenance uh, kind of into into the budget so that we know kind of how long we will keep um, collecting that information for. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the answer is you don't. You can't. You can't keep um, tracking that stuff. And I think it's really about having those uh, reflection points where you're saying, okay, this is something that is making a lot of impact. We need to find more resources to, to keep doing this so that that period doesn't end, whether it's finding new funders or new ways of funding it or whether it's volunteers, etc. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is a question for all of you. Um, I think we'll start with Nana to answer first. Um, have you experienced attacks on your work from the regimes that you're imposing the transparency on? Well, um, thankfully, we haven't experienced any form of aggressive attack. But we also try to ensure that we maintain a friendly rapport with the government. Because at the end of the day, if we don't do that, they they would stop our project and they would not disclose. And really, if they do that, there is very little we can do. Because even when we decide to take them to court for not disclosing with the backing of the FOI Act, sometimes the judge throws the case away. So it's important to, it's almost like a love-hate relationship. We just push each other a bit, but yeah, we haven't experienced any attack yet. Same question? Okay. Um, so, like we know they are monitoring our phones, for example, um, the like Bolsonaro government purchased a lot of those spy uh, Pegasus things. Um, we sued the FBI of Brazil since like 2019, um, but like one of our strategies was to become like big in the media. So it would be a problem. And also, like, I was 22 years old when I started this and when we sued the government, um, the FBI. So I, we got, like, this panel of important lawyers from around the country to be, like, our backers. So that's, that's there on our website because I knew if they saw, like, this young girl there, they'd be like, oh, we're going to we're going to destroy you. So we, we asked for help from, from people. And um, no, I think we're able to protect ourselves, but it's also, you know, like if Bolsonaro won again, a lot of journalists would have left Brazil. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very risky environment. And I feel like people thought that when Lula took over, everything would be fine. And that's not how it goes. Um, yeah, um, we, we kind of try to portray uh, a kind of a, a neutral identity. We do work for government in, in certain instances, so I think that has helped us a lot. Um, but we partner with organizations, and I think the organizations are more kind of activist-driven, um, and they're the ones that often bear the brunt of, of these kinds of attacks. Um, we have worked with journalists. We work with a lot of journalists, actually, and, and honestly, they they seem to be attacked more often than, than organizations, especially those who we're working in the power energy sector, um, energy mining, those ones, they, they do tend to, to be targeted. Um, and then some of our uh, journalists that we've worked with in Swaziland uh, have, have come into some trouble, but I think they, they are quite experienced and they, and they do protect themselves. Or we, we do take it seriously when we move into a sector that there could be uh, issues, but yeah, we we try to remain relatively neutral looking so that we can we can we can pr pr uh, like produce change without having to be the main activist organization. Thank you. Um, another question for everyone, but I think especially to you, Maria, is how do you build a product team capable of doing all of the things that all of you do? So let's start with you, Maria. Um. So, like I said, the first the first systems we built was with 
volunteer friends that coded. Um, then we suffered tremendously for like a year when we hired uh, an outsourced tech team. It was horrible. I hated my job. Nothing worked. Um, and then um, a miracle. And someone sent me this amazing uh, CTO from actually Open Knowledge International that um, like, I don't know, it's just like we couldn't afford him, but he loves our work and he's working with us for a symbolic amount. And then he's training people. We have indigenous people coding for us right now. Um, he's training them. So I don't know if it's a recipe that can be redone, but miracles. <laughs> Well, for us at PPDC, it, it was about um, getting the right people who had the right passion for the project. You know, at, when, we've, when we identified the challenges, it was important that we came together as a team and started work. And we didn't have funding when we started, but because of the need or the issue that we're addressing. We were able to get donor funding from big organizations, MacArthur Foundation, the World Bank, um, Luminate, and you know, other organizations that used to fund it. So it's almost about making sure that your product is meeting a need that you know other people are not meeting. And when that happens, it's easy for sustainability and it's easy to grow your network and your team, basically. Um, yeah, we used to outsource um, a little bit of stuff, but we have insourced a lot more. It's difficult. I mean, resources resources are, are tight. Um, you know, a lot of people come to us and they think nonprofit means free. Uh, it's on a weekly basis we get veiled requests for for free work and unfortunately people in the in the tech sector um are expensive you know coders are, are are very expensive so it's really about we we like to frame the work that we do and why it costs what it costs even though i mean a lot of people come to us so we, we've got a hybrid model we 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 have not 50 50 grants and revenue but we have a, a, a massive portion of our of our kind of sustainable income comes from from revenue and we kind of it's it's taken a, a lot of education of partners and clients and stuff to to kind of explain to them how how financing this kind of stuff works um so uh yeah it's very <laughs> I, I don't really have a great answer you just keep keep going and um I, I think one thing that has helped for us is the environment that we create and i know pizza parties aren't the way to kind of um reimburse people for for doing am amazing work but we have created a work environment that's very flexible we're fully remote and we have an office people uh can go do childcare is, is really really important for us they can go pick up their kids from school so we built in i think a a flexibility and we try to pay our team as as, as well as we possibly can um and i think those two things combined and the fact that we work on a range of interesting things is is how we get good people to 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 work with us yeah that sounds similar to us at my society i think um okay so the next question is for you maria maria can you say a bit more about how you built up your media approach okay um so <laughs> the organization was founded by by two journalists and a lawyer. So we are coming from the perspective of we know what journalists want. I was talking about this with someone yesterday that um, don't send releases to journalists or stuff like, oh, we're doing this or this is important or like a study on something. They they don't want they don't want that. They don't want to help you and they have a hundred things to do and, and they they have targets to meet with clicks and stuff. So you got to make it actually useful for them. So what we did is this newsletter, it's not a bunch of links. It's not, it's just like exclusive data sets that they can use to find scoops and 
be great journalists and receive like praise from their bosses. So it's um, we try to make it like it's five different data sets, usually like with historic um, levels so they can do like big charts and stuff. And there's data for everybody to look at. And we try to make it on the subnational level. So we give like the national statistics and then we give the data for states and cities. And then you get loads of uh, local journalists and news deserts to have actual information they could put on instead of just like buying broadcast news from this economic center. And that really helps. Um, okay, next question's for you, Sean. Um, I think in practical measures, how would you actually measure outcomes? What are the different tools that you can use? Yeah, so I mean, I had that one slide that said, you know, we want to increase what for whom. And I think the way that we go about it is just to reverse that, is find the who, find those people. That's the first trick. Just speak to them. Whether you need a sophisticated tool, find out who those people are, whether it's uh, if they come to an event or you've got their email, you've got a phone call. Speak to those people and that'll help you kind of start sussing out how you will build um, your your data collection process around that. I mean, in, in civic technology, sometimes speaking to one person can blow your mind, which is amazing. But obviously, that's not that's not impact metrics. That's just one story. But it does help start that journey. So go backwards. Who who are the people? What are, what is what is it you were trying to change? And you can speak to them about that. Um, and then you can get that information. Is it going up or, or is it going down? You know, there there are only so many ways that that information is is collected and we kind of all know them. Um, so I think it's just about identifying who those people are and, and speaking to them. Thank you so much. Okay, so this is one for all of you, I think. Um, how effective is the information regulator in your country? Do they intervene effectively or do you find you have to rely on the courts? Do you want to start? Do you have to rely on the Freedom of Information Act? So at first, um, it's information on, on the internet. No, the Freedom of Information Act just allows us to request for data and use the data how we want. But then, of course, the MDAs do not you know, disclose some of those information, but no, we don't have a specific regulation for that um, specific, no, we don't, for procurement information, no. Um, so, oh, I don't know, I'm so much louder at one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so we have a controlling, a controlling agency that is responsible for oversight, other things, and FOIA and open government. Um, it does... It does a pretty good job, uh, but at the national executive branch. Um, so we are always asking them to like actually feel and be responsible for states and cities because the most important data for citizens are not in the national level. Policing is state level. Um, education is city and, and state level. Um, but they they hide behind the curtain of being like, Oh, we can't because like that's like would be overstating our power into s states and cities. And they were like, OK, but who will if not you? Um, and then also they do not take care of the other branches of government. So legislative and um, judiciary are left alone and they are terrible. So like the national executive branch is great at FOIA because it has a strong oversight body but the rest that don't are terrible. So it is very important to have like this strong oversight. And even when like with Bolsonaro, he took, he put a terrible minister for, for the controlling agency, but the body was strong. So like most of the things remain functioning. Um, my, my executive director is actually the, the information access information expert. So she would probably give a, a lot better answer than I can. 
but from my experience, uh, so we do have a, a freedom of, of information law. It's called it's called PIA, so the Promotion of Access to Information Law, but everybody calls it the Prevention of Access to Information Law because it kind of sets up this bureaucracy that the per, the body who's supposed to give you the information uh, can use to kind of tie you in in, in knots. So, I. My unqualified opinion would be toothless and you have to go to court for important stuff. Uh, yeah, it's also very slow and the success rate is 50-50. Is um, Nana, this question is for you and I think it's actually gonna be our last one so you can round us off. Um, what was the level of receptiveness for the training for MDAs? Was there already a desire to do better in terms of proactive disclosure? Well, the receptiveness was, it was there, it was high. But at the end of the day, it's not about, it goes beyond the training is, are they actually implementing and using the knowledge that they've gained? So it's, it's just going back to the CEFTAS program that the World Bank launched, which um, kind of gave state government in incentives to, you know, reach some benchmarks of proactiveness in the procurement processes. So once they've crossed the benchmark, they receive a tra um, some trenches of money. So it's almost similar to what we do or what MDAs are doing. So when they have, when we help them set up their FOI decks, they've ticked a box. So it goes beyond that. Do they actually disclose the information? They really do not, but they are open because it's a free training and we give them, should I say lunch? So they are very happy to have those trainings. But yeah, going beyond that, they hardly ever disclose and we're trying to work on that and see how we can, you know, put measures in place or, you know, push the um, government to actually um, um, penalize MDAs that are not disclosing, you know, using the BPP, the Bureau for Public Procurement. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you, all of our speakers. It's been a really interesting, interesting um, panel today. 